Welcome back. Let's Get Physical Therapy is an educational podcast brought to you by MedStar Health and hosted by me, physical therapist Becca Schumer. I will be sharing the mic with tons of healthcare professionals with the goal of educating and inspiring fellow PTs and future PTs. We hope you find this both informative and inspirational, ultimately optimizing how we treat our patients and grow as professionals. Please enjoy today's episode. Today on the podcast, we have Dr. Wimi Dewogi. He's a very humble man, so I'm going to take the time to tell you a little bit about him because I know he won't. So, Dr. Dewogi is a graduate of the Washington and Lee University in Lexington, Virginia, from the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, and is an alumnus of the Union Memorial Residency Program. He is an orthopedic surgeon and a member of the Mets Orthopedic Institute, serving as a regional medical director of MedStar Sports Medicine and director of sports medicine at MedStar Washington Hospital Center's Department of Orthopedic Surgery. He is also an assistant clinical professor at Georgetown University. Dr. Dewogi also serves as a senior orthopedic consultant for the Washington Wizards, Washington Mystics, and as medical director for the Washington Capitals. He's a consultant for the Baltimore Ravens and NFL Players Association. He served as the medical director and head team physician for the Washington Nationals for seven years up through 2015. Dr. Dewoki also served as assistant team physician for the Washington Redskins, Los Angeles Lakers, Los Angeles Dodgers, Los Angeles Kings, Anaheim Angels, Anaheim Mighty Ducks, as well as for the teams of Loyola Marymount University. He has successfully operated on numerous professional and elite athletes in a wide range of sports. Dr. Dewogi is board certified in orthopedic surgery and holds a subspecialty certification in sports medicine. He specializes in arthroscopic treatment of the shoulder, elbow, and knee. An award-winning researcher who has published multiple articles in peer-reviewed journals, he has lectured internationally on various sports medicine topics. Dr. Dewogi was an All-American and Hall of Fame lacrosse player at Washington Elite University and has also won National Judo Championship in 2001. On the podcast today, we're going to talk about UCL injuries, that's ulnar collateral ligament, also known as the Tommy John surgery, and it's pretty cool because Dr. Dewogi actually trained under the physician that did that surgery on Tommy John. So we're really lucky to have Dr. Dewogi here today. Let's give it a listen. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Dewogi. We're really excited to have you talk all things UCL. Becca, so so nice to talk with you this morning. Thank you for having me on the show. Yep. Now I'm going to throw you a little curveball, pun intended. You didn't know this was coming, but I want you to check your phone because I'm I'm dropping you a, a, an old picture, and I apologize that your name is spelled brutally wrong. I had no part in that, but, but I want you to open your phone up and check out a picture I just sent you, and I'd love your oh opinion on it. Oh my gosh! So that picture is when I was a resident. That's hilarious. And so you see the the current chairman regional chief of orthopedic surgery. And I don't think he's drinking Coke, Coca-Cola there. Um, <laughs> Barry Berger, Shane. Pa- oh my gosh. That's, that's a, that takes me back. And yes, you absolutely butchered my name, I, <laughs> but I it, it's phonetic. Name. It's phonetic. It's phonetic. It looks pretty close. Duwogi is how you pronounce it. It's uh, West African. And um, the, the name, the first name spelled wrong as well. So it's funny because when I walk in the room, sometimes people say they expect to see some old Indian guy or I'm Hawaiian. And I said, no, nope, my dad's from West Africa from Ivory Coast. But uh, that's a that's a great picture. I was much thinner then, too. Again, I had no part in the spelling of your name on that. I know how to spell your name. I've written it too many times in the last year. <laughs> uh, anyway, all worse. right. So th- that's a kind of like good dovetail into hearing about your your story. How did you become an orthopedic surgeon? What brought you into the field? So I, I played sports ever since I was a kid, um, and my my dad always liked to quote um, uh, "mensa non corpore sano," which means sound mind, sound body. And so we had to play sports. We had to be good in school. We had to play instruments. We had to do all kinds of things, and and we had to do them well. And um, you know, if I came home with a a B plus, um, you know, that's in Africa a B plus is an F. So uh, we, we were always sort of held to a really high standard. And I went through a period of rebellion. But after I was uh, done with that, I realized the tremendous opportunities that my parents had afforded me. And I wanted to be able to do something when I was in my career um, where I could continue to be involved with sports uh, even after I was not able physically. And so orthopedics seemed the natural pathway. I played lacrosse in college and one of my teammates um, had had multiple ACL surgeries and he was a huge contributor on a, on a team my senior year that went to the playoffs 
And I just thought, man, that's amazing stuff to be able to fix someone and, and get them back to play and contribute and have uh, life experiences that they'll never forget uh, was very impactful for me. Well, it's funny because, you know, playing lacrosse in New Jersey, in my hometown, in Montclair, New Jersey, it was a really big sport. And kind of every other town, it was big. But in the town in between, they'd be like, you know, what is that, a fishing net? And, and you know, like, so Verona and Caldwell, they didn't know anything. You know, they, they weren't big in lacrosse, but Montclair was big. And then Ridgewood and other, other towns throughout New Jersey. And so what's interesting is it's a spring sport. And so we always competed with baseball. And so... You know, I was just like, that's not really a sport. Like, what are they doing? Like, they don't run. They don't just sit standing around and chew tobacco. And the irony is now here I call myself a baseball doc. Um, and I've, I've uh, learned uh, tremendous respect for baseball. It's, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of pressure and stress. You can't bury yourself in, in a you know, teammate and blame, point a finger, uh, you know, when, when you're the pitcher and and uh, they, the ball gets hit out in the bottom of the ninth and you lose the game, and that's on you. And so the, the mental strain and the physical preparation is tremendous. So I, I've, I've learned to, to develop tremendous respect for baseball. Uh, and, and a lot of that came actually from my experience with Frank Job. Um, so Frank Job was my mentor. I trained with uh, Frank Job, who in 1974 performed surgery on Tommy John. Um, and Frank Job was an was a amazing man. I uh, died in 2015. Um, he was captured in the Battle of Bulge. He was Jewish uh, in World War II and was being marched off to a concentration camp. And he managed to subdue the rear guard and escape, and uh, I think to Austria, I believe, um, to safety. And he never tells that story. He never told that story. I was always told that story from someone else. It's not something that he would want to tell. And that was the embodiment of the man who developed the Tommy John surgery. So when, when he rescued Tommy John's career in 1974, everyone asked, well, why don't you call it the Job surgery? And he said, well, um, Tommy John rolls off the tongue better than Frank Job. Now, Weemi Duwogi, I will have to say, when I hear Frank Job and Tommy John, they're kind of in the same category, but, you know, so I don't understand what he meant by that. I think what he was trying to say, though, um, is that he was really humble and, and uh, very frankly, didn't want the attention. He just wanted to help people. Um, so I think after training with Dr. Job, I just felt a responsibility to carry on his legacy um, and to try to help baseball athletes. Um, I mean, you think of the impact that Tommy John's heard. It's amazing. amazing. Half the players in the league at some point will have a, a Tommy John. I mean, it, it, and you think of the, the Hall of Famers that have had Tommy John surgery and how they would never have been there. Uh, and and you know, if you look at Tommy's story, it's it's fascinating. Um, in 1974, um, he was a power pitcher. Uh, it was 13 and three uh, when when he uh, injured his arm. Was, they were playing at some Montreal Expos. He threw a sinker, and the ball went out into the stands. And uh, so he tried to throw another pitch, and it just he couldn't locate it. And he just walked off the walked off the mound. And so Dr. Job met him in the locker room and in the clubhouse rather, and said you know, what, what's going on? And it's like, I think I, I blew out my arm. And he, Dr. Job had been messing around with some things in the lab. Um, he'd worked on some uh, tendon transfer procedures uh, through polio patients. And he's like, I think I have a solution for this. But he told, get this, he told Tommy Jane, he said, there's a one in a hundred chance that you're going to get back. And to think how far we've come since then, you know, to imagine saying somebody after they've torn their ACL, hey, you got a one in a hundred chance to get back. And the guy says, yeah, sure, do it. And, but there was no other option at that time. Right. And right. so he, he did the surgery and a year later he was, um, he was throwing against live batters and 14 years he played in the league after that. Um, three world series championships. Now he wasn't a power pitcher anymore. He, he became more of a sort of a cerebral, uh, you know, kind of mind games type pitcher, but 14 more years in major league. So that really got things started. And I, I love telling that story because because Frank would never tell it. Um, you know, he, he just sort of go about his business, but the world needs to know what an amazing man he, he is and uh, the impact that he had on, on uh, professional baseball. Incredible story. And I appreciate you sharing it with us. And you had mentioned about 50%, I'm assuming you meant pitchers will have had this UCL surgery, correct, in their career at some point? Yeah, depending upon where you look, up to 50% of pitchers. It's, it's, a, it's an astronomical number. Um, 
And and interestingly, there's data to show that that um, you know if you're if you have a Tommy John, you might even be a better pitcher than if you didn't have a Tommy John. Now there's a lot of confounding variables, and so you have to be careful with a statement like that because then people will come in and say, well, I want a Tommy John on my son. When did he hurt his arm? Well, no, he didn't. I just heard he's got a better chance of playing in the league. That's, that's but, a true story. Didn't that actually happen? It actually yeah. happened. That's it scary. actually happened. I had a patient come into the office, and that's exactly what happened. The parents said they wanted to have their son have surgery. And I said, well, you know, when did he hurt it? And I said, well, he didn't. We just heard he throws faster if he has Tommy John surgery. And so I kind of looked looked down at my watch like very deliberately and I was like, you know, you got 10 minutes before I called child protective services. <laughs> and they did. And the funny thing is they kind of looked at me like, what do you, what do you mean? I had to explain it to them because they had really, they really believed that this was a way to get their son to pitch faster. So, you know, that's part of our job as doctors is dispelling myths, grounding people, weighing the risks and benefits. You know, in my practice, if I can avoid doing surgery and get the person out there, it's a win. I don't want to have to have somebody get operated on. And playing sports, I was always, I mean, it was, it was, you never wanted to hear, hey, you got to get surgery, you know, or, oh, you got to go see the doctor. I mean, that was terrifying. So mm -hmm. I try to put my patients at ease and try to find non-operative solutions wherever we can. And then when it's time to operate, fix it and fix it well. That's kind of a good way to talk about UCL injuries and what are the criteria to operate versus try to treat it conservatively and just let the arm rest for a little bit? Yeah, so I think um, you have to think about the kinetic chain. You have to understand that there's lots of components to uh, you arrive at a diagnosis. And I think I would probably start there, Becca, um, is that, you know, you got to properly diagnose it. Um, you know, people come in like, and they look at an MRI and they're like, oh, I got a tear. I got to have it fixed. First of all, the reality is that probably about 60 to 70% of the patients that I do Tommy John surgery on don't have a complete rupture of their UCL. It's a chronic injury. It's kind of stretched out and it gets to a point where it's stretched out enough over time that it doesn't do its job. And so you might not see a discrete rupture. You might not see a discrete break in the ligament, but that doesn't mean that they don't need surgery. And similarly, if there is a break in the ligament, it may not, you know, high-grade partial tear or a complete tear. In some cases, they may not even need it. R.A. Dickey didn't have a UCL. Um, I had another patient, another player um, with the Nationals who then went to the Padres after he was done with us, and he had a full-thickness UCL tear in his MRI. And he said, Doc, I don't need to have a fix. I just got a little inflammation. I know myself. I know my body. And so I said, all right, sure. And I'm kind of quietly thinking, yeah, whatever, dude, you're going to get surgery. And he pitched four more seasons. And when he went to the Padres, he led them and he had the lowest ERA of their starting pitching staff. Uh, he eventually went on to have Tommy John surgery. But had we done that surgery earlier, he would have missed out on those four years. So, you know, I think you have to be careful. Um, it, it, there's a there's a number of uh, a number of things you have to consider. Uh, you have to listen to the patient's story. And, and you have to look at how they're playing. You know, some people may have some soreness and a partial tear. You let them rest, the soreness goes away, and they get back to play. Now, as for conservative treatment, um, you have to think of the whole kinetic chain. Uh, when you're throwing, it's not just the arm. You know, people would sort of colloquially talk about arm strength. But the reality is the best pitchers are, are supple and flexible throughout their kinetic chain, and they're strong in their core. You know, when you're... When you get whipped with a belt by your dad, um, you know, it's, the belt doesn't have any muscles. It's dad. And you, it's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say anything about my childhood, but, but the, the, um, the point is that the arm is really there to direct the ball and, and finish. And, 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 you know, it's kind of like brush strokes, whereas the, the core, the lower extremity, um, the flexibility, of the hips, the flexibility, of the shoulder. They're really critical core components to um, successfully rehabilitating uh, these problems. A lot of times, patient will have a descended scapula. Uh, they'll have lack of total range of motion compared to the opposite side of 20% or greater. Um, they'll have loss of hip interrotation inter on, on either the drive leg or the stride leg. And if you don't identify those problems, you could fix something and they'll go right back and re-tear. So I think your role, Becca, and, and everything that you do as a physical therapist is probably more important than what we do. Once you get to us, 
you know, if you if you don't pay attention to all those other factors, it, it doesn't matter. This is primarily an overuse injury. It definitely there's a reason why it's happening. So if we don't identify those variables that are causing it, then like you said, if you fix it, then you're just setting yourself up for failure anyway. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Age wise, you know, kids are starting to pitch more and more younger and younger doing different pitches that are affecting their anatomy and all that. So in your clinical practice, how has this changed or evolved? I think the biggest change has been year round baseball. Uh, I mean, I think there was a study back in 2010 where they looked at kids from the the upper hemisphere of the United States and the lower hemisphere of the United States. And they found that the pitchers who were all-stars came from predominantly from the upper half of the United States. And so you're thinking, well, what's, what's that all about? Uh, You know, are they just better athletes? Well, no, I mean, Texas, Florida, California, these warm states, like some of the best athletes come out of these places. But what I really attributed to, And what they attributed to in the study was the fact that when you're done with baseball in the North, you're playing in Minnesota. You ain't pitching. You're you're not playing in the wintertime. You're not, you know, you're not doing those things. So these guys, they wrestle, they play basketball, uh, they're playing football. And so this sort of hybrid vigor of playing all these different sports and learning how to use your body in different ways and giving yourself adequate rest from, from a a tremendously stressful uh, thing, such as a throw is really critical in longevity in sport. And so what I've seen, the biggest thing that I've seen change is, is all over the country is this movement towards year round baseball, which I think is, is potentially problematic. Let's go into the actual surgery for all the PTs out there that are listening that don't know what UCL surgery is. Where's the scar? What kind of, are you using a graft? Are you repairing it? Can you dive into that for us? Yeah, so the the original Tommy John surgery, which I was taught by uh, Lou Yoakum and Frank Job, was a figure of eight tendon weave with the palmaris longus tendon. And I, I remember talking to Dr. Job and his trials, trying to figure out the right graft. And he sat there. And he had a really deep voice and very slow way of talking. I'll never forget. He says, Wamey, I used the Achilles a couple times. Don't ever use the Achilles tendon. And, you know, it just, it was really interesting to hear his, the evolution of his technique. He, was, he used toe flexors at one point, a second toe flexor. So, you know, the palmaris longus tendon is like the perfect tendon for a figure of eight tendon weave using his technique. The contralateral gracilis tendon has become more popular as the docking technique has emerged as, as a more popular technique for a lot of the, the, the young surgeons. Docking technique's a little easier to do. And the outcome studies show that it's just as good as a figure of eight tendon weave. Um, I still do the figure of eight tendon weave. It's the, it's, it's historically the, um, the graft choice and technique, um, with Palmaris that's most prevalent in the league, uh, just because of all the work that, um, Dr. Job, Dr. Yoakum and Dr. Andrews, who were the three most, the three preeminent surgeons who did most of the Tommy Johns, that was what they used. And that's who I learned from. So I continue to do that. But the docking technique is an excellent technique. There's a double docking by George Paletta that, that he uh, espoused that. And I think the bottom line is you want to have a consistent um, technique where you properly place your tunnels with good collagen um, and a proper rehabilitation program. And I think there's a high likelihood of success. Now, Another point, um, I've pioneered uh, use of something called an internal brace in my practice in, in the ACL, but I've also used it in the UCL. And, and uh, Jeff Dugas in Alabama has actually spearheaded the, the elbow work um, and has published some articles, some really nice articles showing that you can actually repair the UCL in certain uh, players and augment it with a Kevlar uh, type suture, a high, high tensile strength braided suture that you thread alongside the, the repair and they do just as well and it's a quicker recovery. Um, I, I would caution that we're still learning about that. And, and I think in the higher level athletes, I err on the side of, of doing a, a reconstruction. But if I have a, a pure avulsion um, and it's fresh uh, and, the, and the ligament quality is good and I'm able to get the ligament back where it came from, I think that's a, it's a great option. How common is it to re-tear? So you look at the data, it, it's like anywhere from 74 to 93 percent of patients will get back to their previous level of playing. So you can assume in there that there's a chunk of those that have retorn. Um, there's other reasons why people quit. They're tired of throwing, end of the career, uh, nerve issues. But I think a, a, a substantial number of those have retorn. I, would, I may say maybe 10 percent of that crew has retorn. 
and the the, the data on retears and revision is not great. You know, whereas 74 to 93% of patients do really well after uh, initial Tommy John, it drops down to 28 to 33% um, with the revision. So once you do it, you want to make sure that you get it right and that it's um, long-term, that they're, they're getting the proper rehab and they don't throw too soon, um, you know, because you don't want to have to go back in again. You brought up nerve damage. How common is, is it to have nerve issues, be it from the overuse injury or be it from surgery? So Dr. Job quoted 40% of patients will have nerve symptoms, but um, it doesn't mean that the nerve has to be addressed surgically when you're fixing the UCL. In fact, the, what happens is when you stretch the UCL out, it runs the, the ulnar nerve runs right along the UCL. And so when it's lax, it puts more tension than the nerve is accustomed to experiencing. And so you'll get ulnar nerve just symptoms, which are paresthesias down into the uh, ulnar one and a half digits. Uh, you'll get some numbness, tingling. Um, you know, so, so I think in my practice, unless they have active symptoms at the time of surgery, I don't do anything with the nerve. I don't even look at it. We split the uh, flexor pronator and go right down and reconstruct the ligament. And most of those patients do great. Um, you know, I think because you're, you're restoring the structural balance of the elbow. And so you're no longer over tensioning the nerve. And so their symptoms go away. But in, I'd say probably about 5% of cases, they have active symptoms at rest um, or with light activities. And in those patients, um, I, I, I transpose the nerve. In fact, I had a young lady that I just did yesterday who had that exact problem. She had a nerve problem and a subtle UCL insufficiency, and they tried to rehab her for about a year, and she didn't get better. And so we, we did an ulnar nerve, uh, excuse me, we did a, a UCL reconstruction along with an ulnar nerve transposition. As far as post-op, how long is the recovery to, let's say, to get back to high-level pitching? So when you're talking about a UCL reconstruction, the, the single number is 15 months. There have been a, a number of studies that have shown major league players that the average return to previous level uh, is 15 months. So 12 to 18 is what I tell my patients. Now, I did a systematic review where we saw that if you, you know, 11 months, there was no harm if you went, you know, if you returned by 11 months. Uh, but I think you have to be cautious. I mean, this is not just a musculoskeletal injury. You know, as you know, there's a lot of proprioceptive issues. There's... Uh, to retrain. And the brain plays a huge role in these major injuries. Your brain after surgery doesn't get right for 18 to 24 months. Uh, it has to cortically remap what it's doing and has to get used to this foreign thing in there that that has changed the way you do things. So I, I really, in, early on, I wanted to get back people as quickly as possible so I could sort of hang up the badge and say, hey, I got him back in six months. But as time goes on, I realize you just want to get it right. And, and you want to make sure that the player feels confident because in a lot of these injuries, the player's mentality and a player's state of mind can contribute to their inability to return to play, even if structurally everything's okay. When the athlete's in your office and they're hopefully getting cleared to go, and obviously you've probably gotten input from the PT as far as functional testing that they've gone through, but what are some things that you're looking for in the office before you're, you're giving them the green light to go? I think confidence. Um, you know, every time I operate on people, their exam's perfect afterwards. So I don't worry about that. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously, you know, I, I tell my patients, I'm not leaving the operating room until I have it perfect. And so technically, you know, we're very meticulous. We make sure we get it right. And, and I can say that pretty much every time we, we get it right. But the issue is that there's so many other factors that contribute. Um, you know, every time you cut through the skin, there's a risk of infection. Uh, you're cutting through nerves in the skin and, and around the, the ligament that can get irritated and they can be painful. And so you have to be attuned to not only the structural stability of the elbow, but to the other factors that contribute to why they might not feel feel right. And so, I mean, as a as sort of a cookie cutter response, I say four months is when we'll let them throw. Um, I think you need three months for that ligament to heal and mature and in, in the, the ligament reconstruction to heal and mature in the tunnel. And then you gradually build up over time. And they'll tell you when they're ready at that point. The gradual buildup is a milestone-based program. It's, there's no definitive timelines. We give ballpark timelines, but some people might be ready to throw at 10, 11 months. Uh, and then others might not be able to throw until they're 18 to 24 months out. And, and both may do equally well in the long term, but you have to be attuned to when that person's ready. And I really try to listen to my patient and how they're feeling. A big part of this and kind of the 
cool part about working with you and having access to our doctors pretty easily is that communication between the PTs and docs and when we have concerns about patients or we want to just share how they're doing. How does that impact your athletes' recoveries? How much communication are you having with the PT? What do you want to know from us with regards to how they're doing or if there are concerns, red flags going on? It's critical. I think for a long time before the age of big data, uh, orthopedic surgeons, we were, we've historically been sort of braggarts and it's kind of arrogant. And, you know, we listen to the loudest voice in the room. And But I think that as time goes on, you start to realize that the best person to be able to tell you about what's happening with the athlete is the one who spends time with them every day. I get a snapshot. They come to my office at two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months. How am I going to be the person that says they're ready to go back to playing? You guys are the ones. And I've seen it with the ACL as well. I mean, we used to do the wiggle at six months and say, hey, you're good to go. And then a bunch of these people would retire and you, everyone's scratching their head like, why'd they retire? Well, because we didn't listen to the therapist that was working with them that told you. They said, hey, they're not ready yet. And so I think it's really critical to have this conversation. I love talking with physical therapists. I think it's so important. I think things like this podcast you're doing are fantastic, getting information out there. Um, you know, I always like to be available to people to talk because I learned so much from you guys. Um, you know, what I, what I learned, if I just focus on orthopedics, you know, I'm going to miss the boat and I'm not going to be as good an orthopedic surgeon uh, as if I communicate with people that are living with my patients every day. And I should say our patients. Just like when I say my kid and my wife says, no, 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 it's our kid. It's our, it's our patient. Right. Cause if you just do the surgery and they, they go off, they don't do any PT, they're in big trouble. A hundred percent. Yep. Is there anything else regarding UCL surgery that you want us to know or that we need to know about when we treat our patients? Be it pre-op, post-op, et cetera. I think be a patient advocate. You guys can be, really can be patient advocates. Um, you know, there's a lot of doctors who are unsure of what to do with these because they just don't see them. Great doctors, fantastic surgeons who don't see a lot of this stuff and sometimes might miss the mark or they might not be sure what to do. And, you know, you know who the guys are. There's a number of guys around the country. We have a number of people in our system that treat these injuries. And, you know, don't don't be afraid to support, you know, to advocate for the patient and say, hey, you know, I think maybe you get a second opinion. And when patients come to my office and they say they want a second opinion, I don't hesitate to offer it. Say, you know, just ask me twice. No, they, <laughs> no. They, if, seriously, if, if they want a second opinion, I think it's important for them to feel comfortable with you. And, you know, a lot of times people will come back, but sometimes they'll go other places. But I think advocate for the patient, be open-minded, try to educate yourself about what's going on around uh, in the world. I think that's, that's my message. The only other question that's kind of in my head, you know, with ACL, we know the ramifications of having surgery and early onset of arthritis, what does this look like for a young little leaguer who is having an UCL injury at, I don't know, 12, 13? What is the rest of their, if you had to look through the magic eight ball and predict their future, what, what are the concerns? Well, the concern is that the shelf life of the UCL reconstruction, we think is about six to eight years. Uh, Daryl Osbar did a study years ago where he, he said that the average uh, return average career after UCL reconstruction was 3.5 years. That sounds horrendous. But if you take out some of the outliers, some of the people who probably weren't going to play anyway, you know, they were kind of fringe players and this sort of made their mind up that, hey, I'm going to go play basketball instead and concentrate on other areas. If you take those outliers out, it's about six to eight years. So if you have a 16-year-old kid and, you know, best case scenario, his career's done when he's 24 or he's getting a revision when he's 24, that's a time when, when, when major league players are just starting to ramp up. So if you have aspirations of having a long major league career and you're getting a Tommy John at 16, you know, it's, it's, it's concerning. It's been a super helpful conversation. I learned a lot. I know everyone else is going to learn a lot and get a lot of laughs out of your incredible stories. You're a great storyteller. Exactly. Yep. All right. We like to end with favorite quotes. I want to know your favorite quote doesn't have to be orthopedic related, just something that motivates you, drives you. So I've become a huge fan of Chinese philosophy. Um, There's some really brilliant stuff very simple things. You know, Phil Jackson was always thought of as the Zen master, you know, and I always thought, "Mm, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. Like, what is he talking about? And as I read it, so there's some really brilliant stuff. So one of my favorite quotes is if you want everything, you must give everything up. And I think that's a, there's a lot of ways that we could probably have a couple hour discussion on what that means. But, um, I think it's, it means that, um, if you want, the things that matter in life, 
you have to give up the things that don't matter, the material, some of the material things, some of the, the unnecessary desires and wants, and focus on the important things in life. And I think that's kind of central to the way I try to live my life. And um, that's my quote. That's deep. <laughs> All right. Dr. Duogi, where can patients find you? Where can PTs find you? So I spend uh, five days a week at the MedStar Lafayette Orthopedic Sports Medicine Center. Uh, downtown uh, on uh, between L and M on 20th Street, and I have an injury clinic Monday mornings in Bethesda, uh, Bethesda, Maryland, on 6410 Rockledge Drive. Um, our office number is 202-416-2000, and I can always be reached. Uh, my first name, middle name, a uh, middle initial, and last name at gunet.georgetown.edu. So since everyone knows how to spell my name, it's really easy. Um, no, they won't even need you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll leave that up to you to spread the word. I will do that. Thank you so much for your time. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. This was fun. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Let's Get Physical Therapy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram at PT. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so we can reach more listeners just like you. As always, we appreciate your time and hope you join us for our next episode.